The word says to taste and see that the Lord is good. Is he good this morning? Yeah. yeah he's good all the time. I just moved my, my podium. Colossians 3, turn there if you would. Uh, happy July 7th, church. Good to be with you. And I uh, just want to mention something I, I failed to mention last week to you, but you know, you are, uh, we are in a position to bless other people in their lives and help sometimes in small ways, sometimes in huge ways. Just to let you know, we as a church community did a few things that I think are worth mentioning. One is uh, uh, we bought a, a scooter for someone in the church that needed a scooter. Um, we uh, helped someone with their rent who needed help with rent. Um, and I got, uh, we work with Hope Women's Clinic. If you're not familiar with Hope Women's Clinic, they're out in uh, Apache Junction, downtown Phoenix. I've known uh, Tiffany and Tammy who work down there. I've known them, Tammy, since elementary school. Some of you are like, wow, that's ancient. Uh, Tiffany, I've known for a while. I went through a seminary with her husband. But um, they sent out an alert, hey, we are in desperate need for, for shampoo. And so we went ahead and bought 100 bottles of shampoo for them. Uh, so you guys were able to do that. So thank you for, uh, for blessing them. And, and that's just that's just scratching the surface. There'll be many, many more opportunities. So uh, if you want to discover more how we uh, not only have been blessed, but are able to bless others, uh, let me know. Uh, on your communication card, write blessing because... We are poised to bless people in the name of Jesus. What compels us? The love of Christ compels us. And so the world needs to be blessed, don't they? We live in a world where there's a lot of taking, but there's not a lot of giving. And all I know is Jesus said in Acts, you are more blessed if you give than you receive. Amen? Amen. On that topic, we get to talk about parents and children today. So, uh, ooh, this is tough, man. Colossians 3, turn your Bibles if you would there. So, uh, social media tells us a lot about our, our culture and where people are at and um, you know you can you can go into eBay you can go on to uh, Amazon you go to Instagram you go to Twitter whatever you know outlet you you want to use eBay a guy several years ago posted this as an auction uh, the title for the auction was this best mother in the world and he put this auction out there and he basically said that uh, the winning bidder would receive an email from his mom Sue Hamilton but uh, her son promised that she will make you feel like they're the most special person on earth. So how many people went and actually looked at this ad? 42,000 plus people mm. went on eBay to see this ad. How many people bid on it? 92 <clears throat> bids on it. Started out at a dollar and finished at $610. Just to get an email from a mom who would basically make you feel like you're the most special person in the world. What does that tell us? It tells us that there's a parental craving among people out there. Just like last year I mentioned to you Craigslist, this guy posted looking for a dad to teach me how to barbecue so I can barbecue for my family on this 4th of July. There's, there's a hunger out there, you guys. There's a hunger for parents to be present in their kids' lives. And this is not about those of you who have children biologically. This is about us as a village led by the village leader, Jesus. How do we parent others? So you don't sit here and be like, you know, oh, parenting, I, why am I even here today? If Scott had only told me this was about parenting, I would have slept in today. <laughs> All of us have a responsibility in the parenting of children in our world. Because I hear things like this and I go, how can I be a father to those that are fatherless? My wife, how can she be a mother to those that are motherless? And this is a good news message this morning too because whether you've got kids out of the house, whether you have kids in the house, whether you're preparing to have kids in the house, this hits us all right where we need to be because ladies and gentlemen, we live in a relational desert. Write that phrase down. We live in a relational desert. Whether we're talking about parents and kids, husbands, wives, friends, neighbors, relationships are becoming a rare commodity. And you do not have relationships over social media. I text my dad all the time. Doesn't mean you're close to him. I email my wife all the time. Doesn't mean you're close to her. 
We live in a relational desert. And in the area of parenting, the, the, the very thing that God has given to us, this basic cell for human society, we have been incredibly negligent. Amazon currently has, guess how many books on parenting available? Anyone want to take a stab at it? How many? 15,000, not even close. How many? 76,669. Not that I went and counted this week. I, I had other things to do, like tend to my children. But 76,000 books on parenting. And yet, what we have discovered is that while we have some books on parenting, boy, living out the parenting culture is a lot more difficult than we realize. And I think the difficulty has just compelled people to say, I'm, I'm just going to walk away from it. See, like we talked about husbands and wives last week, what we have to understand is that the Bible elevates the, the relationship between parent and child because the Bible elevates the value of children. Last week we talked about how Paul's writing to a culture that devalued women. In Jewish law, women were nothing but a possession. And in Greek law, Roman law, women were treated as servants and slaves and did whatever their husbands bidding, and they had no lives for themselves. Well, Paul writes to a culture that, again, elevates the value of children. Did you know under Roman law, there was a law called patria potestis, meaning the power of the father, the father could do anything he wanted with his children. He could sell them, he could turn them into slaves, he could even kill them and be right in doing so. And so Paul's writing to a culture that says, we don't treat children like that. God is designing them with more worth, more dignity than you could ever imagine. And so he writes to this culture and says, how do we, as those who know Jesus, reveal the fullness of Christ in our homes? We talked about the fullness of Christ in marriage last week. Tonight, today we get to talk about the fullness of Christ in our relationships with our children. Why? Because God is building a new society. He's creating a new humanity. We call this the third race. Right? There's, there's this idea that all of us in Christ are now displaying for the world what grace looks like, what forgiveness looks like, what healing looks like. And God is doing a work in us so that the society that is broken can see how God mends broken lives, broken homes, broken marriages, broken children. And he's doing it through us who know Jesus. So there's the hope that we have that God is behind this. But more than sitting here this morning and pointing out boy, let me just tell you about my children and run through the laundry list of their little sins and their little, you know, uh, mis misdeeds and all this. We need to understand, just like marriage, what it reflects is where my heart's at with the Lord. Whenever I sit with a couple and we're talking about marriage, it's not about pointing fingers at the other person. It's about what does God want to uncover about your heart? Parenting does the same thing. And we're going to talk about that because here's what parenting reveals. It does, the children don't create the problem. They're only revealing the problem. Hmm, that blue page right there. See, children don't create the problems. They're merely revealing the problems. So this morning we get to talk about this. So let's start with a word for everyone. No matter where you're at, God's fathering of me is ultimate. See, God as father and how I walk with him as my father is the ultimate experience that God has for everybody. There's nothing more important than to know God. And in knowing God, there's nothing important, more important than walking with God. And there's nothing more important than walking with God and knowing that I don't have to earn his approval, but that in Christ I'm already approved. There's no performance-based relationship in Christ. Can I get an amen from you? That's why we celebrate communion. That's why we sing songs about Jesus, because he has done it all. And now I'm given the title child of God. Now I can address him as Abba, Daddy. Are you kidding me? So here's the word for everybody. Two things we learn about God as Father. Number one, there's a revelation of God's character. That he wants to love us. He wants to disclose himself to us. Ephesians chapter 3. Look what Paul writes. 
such wonderful words. He says this in verses 14 and 15. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. See, Paul says that God sets the course for how our lives are are to be structured. This is not saying that God is the spiritual father of everybody. This is merely saying that God has set forth a pattern. And for those that are spiritually connected to him through Christ, we are therefore to model somehow this parent-child relationship. That he is creator, that he is sustainer, that he is provider, that he is protector. Do you know God at this, at this level? That not only he's the one who's brought you into existence, but he sustains your existence. He protects you in your existence. He provides for you in your existence. And so every task of every human parent is to reflect the image of God like this to their kids. That we are there to provide and protect, to sustain. You created them, but we know ultimately who created them, right? Because this is where we talk about the sanctity of life. Can I just do a little aside real quick? This is why we are pro-life. This is why we support children in utero. They are not fetuses. They are little human beings in formation. Psalm 139, this is why the Father knows us when he's forming us in in the inward parts in our mother's womb. Amen? This is why before the foundation of the world, God knew us. This is why we protect those who don't have a voice for themselves, which is funny because in the pro-choice movement, it's like, well, I have a right over my body. Well, what about the right over the little body that can't speak up for itself? So we recognize that God has given us gifts that we are to provide for and protect and to sustain. So we are staunchly pro-life. Amen? We are staunchly sanctity of life. And that not only means on the front end of things, that means on the end of things too, where we protect the life of those who are elderly, who are older, who cannot make choices for themselves. And so we value human life, period. Amen? Can we get a little applause? It's a golf clap. I like that. Good putt, Scott. Good putt. So we are image bearers. And we are bringing into the world little image bearers. So the, the, the character of God shows me to some extent, however imperfectly, please keep that word in mind, that I imperfectly somehow strive to model God's character to my children. None of us will be perfect. And we'll talk about that here in a bit. Second thing is that there's the revelation of God's heart. God's heart says that God wants us to know him as heavenly father, that we learn to parent God's way by imitating him, and nothing is more important for godly parenting than to walk with him and know him. The breakdown is when you do not cultivate a walk with God, and so therefore there will be a breakdown in how you mirror God's image to your children. The closer I am to the heart of God as an individual, the closer I am to be able to reflect his image to my children. If there's a disconnect with me and my kids and mirroring his image, there's a disconnect with me walking with him. Does that make sense? And so what we have to understand is that God has given us, and if you think about this when it comes to parenting, there's really only two rules. You guys ready for this? I'll add to the Amazon book list of 76,000 books another one. It'll be the shortest. It'll be two chapters. Here they are. Number one, God teaches us in parenting to curb their will, and number two, to cultivate their worth. Let's just stop. Isn't this discipleship? (laughs) Isn't this for us? How often does God need to curb our will? Every single day. Because my heart wants what it wants, and God steps in and says, you don't want that. Because usually what my heart wants is something that only God can provide, but I'm looking for a substitute. So he has to curb my will. Children are not born sweet, little, innocent, cuddly, you know, do-gooders. They are natural born sinners. And I'm going to say this, and you've heard me say this again. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. 
So the next time you're, you're ooing and aahing over a little baby, maybe don't vocalize it to the parents, but sit there in the back of your mind, this is just a little sinner that's come into the world. Oh, isn't this little precious little sinner? You can throw words out like depraved. You can word, throw out words like disobedient, rebellious. I mean, when was the last time you got a card? Right, you know, for a, a newborn, right? Oh, God bless you, you new little rebellious, depraved child, right? Like, we don't think like that. But when you watch them grow, and for those of you that have raised them, you start to see that sin nature come out, don't you? So you have to curb their will. The, the language in Proverbs, and I'm going to tell you about Proverbs 22, how it's led a lot of parents astray, thinking Proverbs 22 is a promise. Proverbs 22 is not a promise. Train up your child in the way he or she should go, and when they're older, they're not going to depart from it. How many of you have seen that verse fail in your life, just raising kids? Just to be honest, there's a lot. But we are, we're sold that that's a promise when in reality Proverbs are not promises, they are principles that generally work. Train up, literally, two things that word communicates to us. You curb their will, you cultivate their worth. The word is used of a wild horse where you put a bridle in its mouth and you train it because it's Natural instincts wants to do things that are hurtful to itself and to others. You want to see a great movie recommendation of the week? The Mustang. Who saw, who's seen it? Awesome, isn't it? The Mustang is about a true story about the correctional facilities that are in place in Wyoming and Idaho and Arizona. They go out and they bring these wild horses to the prisons. And they connect prisoners with these wild horses so that there is a breaking of the spirit so that they are now trained to do what they were designed to do. And then these horses go on auction and farmers and ranchers and everyone buys these horses. And the story chronicles not only the, 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 the horse, but the people whose wills also need to be corrected and how not only do animal but human alike learn the breaking of the will and the channeling of a more positive direction for their lives. Incredible. One of my top movies of the year. R-rated, I'll disclose that, but it's not, it's not, you're all adults. Most of you, I'm looking up. <laughs> Red box, rent it. God is the, he needs to curb our will. But there's not only a curbing of the will, and I know some parents that have a lopsided view of parenting. You know, I'm going to curb the will, I'm going to curb the will. And what you do, is, do you do is you set out to destroy depravity, but you, get, you forget the second part where you have to encourage their dignity. Parenting is not destroying de de depravity. It is encouraging their dignity. This is where you have to cultivate their worth. This is why as a parent, and this is the, probably the hardest part, my default is to correct and punish. For me, I'm confessing. That's why my kids come to me and they'll say, Dad, can... no, I already know what you're gonna say, no. They, to, they answer the question for themselves before they even approach me. I don't wanna be that dad, right? Like, did you ever grow up or you went to one parent because you knew they're probably gonna be a little bit more open or gracious than the other parent? So they go to mom, because she definitely embodies more grace than I do. But we have to learn that the word train also communicates this cultivating of worth. A, 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 a nurse that came alongside with children that were born, when they were born, they'd come, and then the nurse would put her finger in crushed dates and put the, the finger in the child's mouth to start activating this sucking response. And once the sucking happened, the nurse would give the baby to the mother, and the mother would breast breastfeed the child. And the word for training is cultivating a taste for something good. And so the nurse would sit there and the baby would be like, smiling maybe, like, oh, this is good stuff. Crushed dates. Who wouldn't want crushed dates, right? And they create a taste in the child's mouth. And ultimately, this is what God wants us to do. He is saying to us, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that there's nothing more valuable to your worth than knowing who your identity in him is. What that looks like, how you live that out. And so this is for everybody, right? God is curbing our wills and he's cultivating our worth. So what does this look like at the, on, the, on the parental front in the, in the homes? First, second point is this. Here's a word for the children. 
for the children. Here we go, Colossians 3. Starting in verse 20. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, verse 21, do not exasperate your children that they may not lose heart. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. So last week we had two verses, one for men, one for women, husband and wife. Today we get two verses on parenting. If only life were this simple. We got the whole family household represented in four verses. But it's not that easy. Verse 20, here's it, the instructions for children. Verse 21, here's the instructions for parents. Kids, one responsibility. Obey your parents. For this is pleasing to the Lord. And that's the overarching objective, right? We want to live lives pleasing to the Lord, to let our children know that we are their authority and that we want them to do what's right, not because it's about us, but because it's about God. And fathers, don't exasperate your children, right? Because you don't want them to lose heart. So what is Paul talking about here? So notice the first concern for children. The relationship between parent and child is centered on their common devotion to the Lord. The Lord helps make things a little bit easier. The, the Lord is that one target that that household is to be aiming for. Whether husband, wife, aim for Christ. Parent, child, aim for Jesus. And here's the responsibility for the kids, right? Just obey your parents. Paul echoes this in Ephesians chapter 6. Look what he writes elsewhere. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, where he's now referring to the Ten Commandments, where it's your... Honor your mom and dad, and this is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. And how many parents have not thought or at least uttered, right, when their children are disobedient, like, I just really want to take you out of the world right now. This is good for you, right? For you to live well in the land, honor your parents. And in, in, in what, what we're saying is this, you need to cultivate in your kids, here it is, respect for authority. And boy, the breakdown in our culture in this area is getting nastier and nastier. Where if they don't learn in the home how to respect authority, they will not respect authority once they're out of the house. As a matter of fact, Paul in a couple places, and I don't have the verses up here, but I'll give them to you right now. Romans 1.30, he says, a culture is on a slippery slope to hell when there's a disobedience to parents. Romans 1 30, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. He says, disobedience to one's parents is a mark of the last days when wickedness will abound. That if you don't teach your children to respect authority, this is going to be a very wicked culture. This is not a small or insignificant matter. Obedience pleases the Lord. As adults, obedience pleases the Lord. Amen? Teaching our children, obedience is pleasing to the Lord. And, you know, I have parents, and I'll talk to parents, where they don't want to be the child's authority figure. They want to be their bestie. <laughs> you are not called by God to be your child's best friend. You are called by God to be an authority figure in their life. But then my kids won't like me. Show me in the Bible where it says, let your children like you. You are not called to be liked. You are called to be respected. And the children are reflecting through their resentment to authority how mom and dad wanted to be their buddy, but not their authority figure. Culture is speaking. Culture is judging. Culture is condemning and saying, we don't want you to be our friend. We want you to be our authority figure. Because this is huge. Obedience is absolutely necessary for education to take place. Because education implies a deference to authority. That you know something I don't know. That you've been around longer than I've been around. And we are educated by those who have this 
mentality that says, I'm going to help you better function in the world, so you better listen to me. Anyone would ever watch Prager U online, YouTube? Uh, so Dennis Prager, he just released this week this topic. So he brings out a, a psychologist, sociologist, and he speaks about parenting to children. And one of the cool things, if you watch, it's like a three, four minute video. Don't watch it now. Be disrespectful to me, all right? <laughs> he says, as parents, one of the things you should not do is get down to their level and look at them eye to eye when there's issues that need to be dealt with. Because what that is non-verbally communicating through your bodily actions, that you're on the same level as your child. He said, you stand straight and you look down at your child. Not that this is condescending, but this is your way of saying, I have authority over you. That's awesome. Because my kids, they understand it. As much, and the older they get, the more they fight. The older they get, the more they push back. Well, why? Can I have this? No. Well, why? Because I'm your dad. That's why. <laughs> because I'm your mom. That's why. Do you not think we know better than you? And they're not, again, not that we're coming across all harsh and, and condemning, but we're doing it with a heart that says, trust me. Trust me me that I know what's better for you than you think you know what for yourself. And so we have to understand that the only way we grow is in deference to authority. And, at, and, and there's no human authority that deserves absolute obedience, but when there's a biblical reverence at play, you need to teach your kids that, that you are God's given authority in their life. And you cultivate their worth in Christ by correcting their behavior. And this is why discipline is key. Discipline, biblically speaking, is evidence that you love your child. The absence of any sort of discipline actually says you hate your child. Rome, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, 13. Whom the Lord loves, those he disciplines. I'm thankful that God loves me and cares enough for me that when I am out of bounds, when I'm off track, that he steps in and corrects me. See, discipline is not punitive. Discipline is corrective. Now, as you write that word down, corrective, I also want you to keep another word in mind. This is our transition to the third point. This is the word for parents. While you seek to correct, it is more important to connect. So write those two words, because here's the balance. How do I correct and yet remain connected to my child? Because as you probably heard me say before, when you have a household that is full of rules and there's no relationship, that will ultimately lead to rebellion. And if there's all relationship and no rules, that relationship will ultimately lead to resentment. See, while correction is important, connection is more important. And how you keep these in balance is key. So children, obey your parents in all things, for this is pleasing to the Lord. And in a sense, what's implied there too is that mom and dad are obedient to, to the Lord in all things. And there's times we don't want to be obedient to God, but he's the authority over us, right? So we model this obedience, and we pass it off to our kids, and we teach them. But parents, fathers. Now, the word fathers, there it's, it's not like moms are, are out of the picture. Just so you guys know, look at verse 21. This, while God may hold the primary responsibility of what that household looks like on the, the male, there is also implied here that this is mom and dad working together. As a matter of fact, the same word can be found in Hebrews where it is used of parents in general. So ladies, moms, what, don't check out. Parents, do not exasperate your kids. What translation do, do, does yours say? What, what word does it say in your Bibles in, uh, on verse 21? Provoke. Provoke. What else? Embitter. So we're getting the idea. What was it? Aggravate. So there is a tendency for parents, specifically fathers, 
to embitter their children, right? Because we can get frustrated. And when we get frustrated, we may put the hammer down a little bit more, right? We may, we may act out of the flesh rather than follow the Spirit. And Paul is saying, I need to caution you parents to not react but respond lovingly to your kids. Because parenting is, is sometimes, I'm going to say most of the time, it's better caught than taught. Amen? There's a New York Times article that came out, I just read a couple days ago, and the title of the article was this, Some Families Are Hiring Coaches to Help Them Raise Phone-Free Children. Right? Technology is a horrible parenting tool. Amen? You don't just throw your kid, and again, I'm walking just this past week, I'm walking with my family, and we were at the mall, and in the food court, there were parents, and I saw this a handful of times, their little kids just had a little phone or a little tablet in front of them. The parents were just chatting, and, the, and, the, and they're just, the kids are just watching the, the phone. And I'm going to tell you right now that that is not organic. There is something more to parenting than throwing your kid a tablet or, or a smartphone. So these companies are coming out to say, we will come in for at least $80 an hour to help teach you what it means to parent your kids without devices. As if parents aren't smart enough to do this on their own. Here's the fear, right? <gasps> I don't want my child to not like me. So I want someone else. Can I just tell you right now, the role, the role you have in raising your children, you do not give away to your schools, to your churches, to some $80 an hour professional. You are their parent. I know parents in the churches, they're like, what do you have for my children? Because I want you to disciple my kids, and I don't want to. They're not saying that, but that's what they're implying. Right? Youth group, i.e., my child's discipleship program, so I get a free night. And I get time off from engaging. My wife is my primary ministry, and my children are my number one disciples. Don't forget this. And they are your disciples, whether they're in your house or out of your house. My responsibility, number one, is to my wife, and my responsibility, number two, is my children. And I am raising little disciples, and my primary job is to correct them, but more importantly, to connect with them. And this is what Jesus taught. Isn't it? When he says, when you pray, pray this way, our Father. See, this was what was revolutionary about the teachings and, and life of Christ. He basically took a system that... No way you got comfortable with God. He was like the divine judge, the divine policeman. You just, you just kept your stuff in order, and you did what was pleasing to him, and there was no relationship. And Jesus comes and says, here's what I want you guys to do. When you go and pray, just say, dear daddy. And the religious leaders were like, what? what? You, can't you can't relate to God like that. And Jesus says, why not? Because God wants to be involved in your lives. And what Jesus does is he says, you need to understand that you are able to have a connection with God. And more than anything, he wants you to know him as daddy. He wants you to know him as father. And so you need to understand when it comes to connection with your child, God says, I want you to know how to relate with your child. And, my, and the first concern, look at verse 21 is not your child's behavior, heart, attitude, sin. What is the first concern you ought to have as a parent? You ought to be introspective about where your, your heart's at. Fathers, do not exasperate your kids. Do not embitter your kids. Do not provoke your kids. The primary concern for you as a parent is your own sin. Don't we want to make it about someone else's issues? Who, who likes to do that? Just curious. I, I'm right there. Like, when God's dealing with me on something, it's like, how can I blame somebody else? When it comes to parenting, this is the primary place where God's showing you your heart. So the primary concern for any parent is this. Where am I at with my heart and what's going on with sin in my life? And what sin is there that's happening that is preventing me from being a better parent to my kids? How am I relating to my children with what God wants me to focus on? This is why Paul says in Ephesians 6, verse 4, these words, Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, as hopefully you are being brought up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Am I harming or helping my child? Again, your child's not creating problems. They're merely revealing problems. 
Henceforth, what is it revealing about me? How am I as a parent harming or helping my child? This is on you. And so I come before God and say, God, show me, please. In my life, where am I erring? Where am I going wrong? Where is there sin? Because I must recognize two things. My child is extremely vulnerable in light of my extremely important vocation as a parent. Their vulnerability is not a place for me to live recklessly out of my vocation that God has called me to. And so as a parent, I have to maintain a walk with Christ and live out of a place where I am walking with my Abba Daddy and He has shown me my heart and I'm, I'm desiring obedience for my kids, but at the same time, not alienating them from relationships. Three points here. First is this. The environment you create is of the utmost importance. Research has shown that parents spend approximately, and I'm going to say fathers, spend only 37 seconds a day with their kids. 37 seconds a day. Which means what? They're not eating dinner together. They're, they're barely even talking. Could just be, hey, how you doing? Okay, great, but And then separate. This is why there are orphanages all around the world where they are in desperate need of people just to come and hold children. There are so many psychological developments that are not happening because there is no connection between an adult and a child. Children are in cribs and sometimes in cages where they have no contact with another person and how that brings trauma into a young developing person's life are, are things that we are dealing with at, at a mass level. And to hear 37 seconds a day a parent connects with their child, no wonder our society is becoming what it is. Embrace these things folks, that the environment you create ought to be one where your children understand their worth. Because 37 sequen seconds will equal resentment. You don't love me, you don't care for me, and I'll, I resent you. And your time is no substitute for just gifts. Don't we tend to do that? Like we throw things at our kids like, what do you mean I don't love you? I bought you that thousand dollar tablet. There's, there's, there's no substitute. Deuteronomy 6, write these down, because this is part of the culture of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These are the words I command you today. They shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your kids. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, how often should you connect with your kids at a spiritual level? All the time. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be on the frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing, there should be a regular, cognizant awareness of God. Spiritual principles spiritual ethics, more importantly, spiritual relationships. This is what was required of Israel. Do not forsake these things. And then you want to know how Jesus echoes this? Very familiar passage, Matthew 28. Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We, if you've grown up in church, save this for Mission Sunday. Commission. How many of us have ever thought this is first and foremost applicable to our home? Go therefore into the world and teach them to obey, observe all that I have commanded. Sad is the person that is zealous to share this with someone overseas, next door, at their work, and doesn't do it 
in their own house. Can I get an amen? But it's never too late to do what's right. It's never too late to point people to the most important tool in parenting. You guys know what the most important tool in parenting is? The Bible. We are able to learn about our hearts there and we're able to learn about our relationship with God. And I'm going to tell you right now that there's been too many negative conditions that we have created in our environment for our kids. You want, just write these down. These are, these are little bonuses. Ignore them. No child ever l- is able to walk in a healthy way with Christ when they're ignored by their parents. A father or mother who has no time for their child soon creates deep-seated resentment, right? Where they, because of you're ignoring them, they feel unimportant, they feel worthless. How about this? Indulge them. Give them everything they want. And you know what happens when you're given everything you want? You still are restless and dissatisfied because any gift without the giver, right? Any possession without the relationship is empty. So indulging them doesn't help. How about insulting them? Maybe you grew up in an environment where sarcasm and cynicism and name calling was the, was, the, was the flavor of the day, right? Calling them names and putting them down is only another source of resentment, and they become in- discouraged and they put off anything related to God. How about number four? Uh, you irritate them. Yes, these all begin with the letter I. Today's parenting lesson is brought to you by the letter I. Irritate them. How do you irritate them? Well, you keep on hammering away at them. You keep on nagging at them. And if you continue to do that, they're going to become discouraged. And lastly, you're inconsistent. You and your spouse need to be on the same page. You need to be consistent. You can't change the rules from one day and then change it to something else the next day. You have to be consistent with your kids. So what are the positive conditions? There are three of them. Write these down if you would. Parental presence, parental praise, Parental pleasure. Now we're going to the letter P this morning. What are the positive conditions? And let me just say, all of these I'm going to reveal to you right now are couched in this. You are not called to build up your child's self-confidence. You are to build up their God-confidence. We have far too long lived in a culture where it's all about Pick yourself, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, right? Get out there and do it again. You're just build your self-confidence. Self-confidence is the problem. God confidence is the much needed item in our lives. Because what does Paul say? He says, don't exasperate your children, right? Because they don't want to be discouraged. You don't want to discourage them. They don't want, you don't want them to lose heart. I'm going to tell you right now, the, the, the biggest thing that makes us lose heart is self-confidence. Because we put our hope in the wrong things, we love the wrong things, we trust the wrong things, and the very thing we need God is the very thing we leave out. Self-confidence is not what it's about. God-confidence is what it is about. And what does God-confidence show us? It shows us grace. It shows us forgiveness. It shows us joy. It shows us hope. Because we're trusting in something that has nothing to do with us and all to do with our maker, our creator, our sustainer, our God, our father. Amen? So what do I mean by number one? Parental presence. What it means is that you are involved in their lives. You are there when they need you for instruction and guidance. You are there to show them the the way to reveal to them your heart to not only bring about the the rebuke when rebuke is needed, more more importantly, show them the the approval that they have because they're your child. And this can only happen through connection. Your presence in their lives is important. Just like Jesus pointed to you, go to God and you say, Abba, Daddy. The fact that there's a God who will never leave us or forsake us, amen? There's a God who walks with us through the fire, amen? He walks with us through the floods, amen? That there's a God who says, I will never throw the towel in on our relationship, but I'm with you always, and our children need to know that, that no matter what we do, whether it be obedient or disobedient, whether it be to honor them or to dishonor them, that we're with them to the end. So your parental presence is important. Secondly, your parental praise is equally important. 
the first words uttered by God the Father to God the Son just before he was embarking on his earthly ministry was this. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. From Father to Son, here's what he sets him on, out on. I'm well pleased with you. How oh, are kids need to hear that? How oh, every single person needs to hear this, that you believe in me. You are pleased in me. That there is going to be praise that comes from your lips. There's going to be time for correction. But may it always be truth that's seasoned with grace. May it always have an eye towards hope that he who is beginning a good work in us will complete it. And lastly, there's going to be parental pleasure. Meaning this, the dominant tone of your relationship should be one that you delight in your child. You cherish them. You seek to nourish them. That you're sitting there going, I am so glad you're with me. But I tell you, through the, through the roller coasters of parenting, your kids, at, at the end of the day, just need to know, you know what, you're mine. And I'm glad you're mine. And I, and I, I delight in you. And I'm thankful that God sings this song over us, aren't you? And he says, I know how much you mess up, and I know how far away you walk from me, and I know the sin that goes on in your life. And there's still a God who says, there's nothing I delight more than to sing over you because you're mine. Don't you need to hear that? Your kids need to hear this too. Parental pleasure. Second point, the example that you set. And we're going to fly through these things quickly. Let, let me push pause. Because my, my better half is here. Mm -hmm. And up to this point, I mean, there's a lot. Anything you would add? Well, as I look around this room. Don't do that. First rule you don't do. Don't look around the room. Just kidding. What I said in context was, as I understand God's character and how he relates with me, I'm going to mirror or, or image that as a father to my children. Right. Yeah, you're not raising carbon copies of you. You're, you're cultivating a child that has their own personality. They're going to develop their own interests. They're going to develop their own talents. What you're doing is you're providing a context, more importantly, for them to understand who God is and how much God wants to be involved in their lives. Does that, does that help? Okay, cool. And we're going to get to your first question here in a moment. We're actually going to land the plane on that one. Okay, so the example you set. Um, you may have never thought about your home like this, but here's what I want you to think about your home. And this is good for kids that are yet to come into your home. If you're a young couple, maybe having kids or you have small children, or even if you don't, your home is a little church. And your little church, worship services happen all the time, and you're the pastor. This is how the Puritans thought. The Puritans said, my home is a little church. Mom and dad are pastors together, and we are going to worship God. We're going to create a culture that says, you know what, we, we're, as for me and my house, we're going we're gonna to serve the Lord, right? So your house is now the place where worship services happen. Because let's be honest, we can all wear a, a facade or mask for an hour and a half on a Sunday. Amen? All of us can come and play a part for an hour and a half. But where the true test, the true reflection is behind your closed doors where there's no one else. That's the, that's the primary church. 
Because here's what happens. You ready for the, there's two H words I'm going to give you. The first one you're not going to like, hypocrisy. Some of you have set an example of what not to do. <laughs> right? Don't, don't say with your mouth one thing and conduct your life in a totally opposite way. How many kids are leaving their homes of, of, of origin and birth and upbringing and they're walking away from not God but the church because they've seen hypocrisy? We have to guard ourselves against this. Like I said, more is caught than taught. Well, we went to church twice a week and we watched Christian movies and we listen to Christian music. But if mom and dad don't live out the fact that they are passionate about Christ, all your Christianese and your Christian environment is nothing. If you don't love Christ with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your kids know it, they're smart. So you have to guard against hypocrisy. And you know what this means? It means we need to embrace, here's the second H word. You ready for this? Humility. Kids, I've done a horrible job reflecting the character of God to you today. I'm going to admit my mistake. I'm going to own up to my sin. I'm going to ask you for forgiveness. And we're going to start we're going to start the journey again. I remember the first time like, I apologized to my kids. I don't think they knew what was happening. Right? Like, because we're the authority figures, right? And it's like, no way have we ever modeled in our home, like, mom and dad aren't perfect, and, we, you know, we're, we're mistake-free. Boy, the moment you do something, and your kids are at that stage where they need to see you broken, and they need to see you contrite, and they need to see you repentant, and you're admitting your faults and mistakes, and you come to them for forgiveness, and they're just like, what's going on right now? You're crying and they're crying. What you're modeling for them is the gospel. That God loves us the same way. That we come before him and we don't have our lives and acts and everything together. And God loves broken people. And when you live out that brokenness for your kids, there is more modeled in one instance of brokenness and, and, and asking for forgiveness than there is in probably reading a hundred Bible verses to your kids. While you're called to share with your kids the gospel and you're called to point to the gospel repeatedly, there's nothing more important than modeling it in front of your kids. Wow. I mean, here's, here's the mantra, right? Philippians 3, verse 8. How will your kids know that you count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ? That for his sake, you will suffer the loss of all things and count them as nothing in order that you may gain Christ. Kids don't see this. They see dad clamoring over a job, mom clamoring over a job. Gotta have this car, gotta have this house, gotta go on this vacation, gotta have this type of furniture, gotta have this size home, gotta live in this community. We are counting everything as rubbish to, to fulfill our desires and our pleasures and our goals. But they're not seeing desperation for Christ. And we wonder why, like, no, oh, I don't want to want my kids to love Jesus because they didn't see it in you. my kids to know that there's nothing more important than Jesus. There's no possession worth more than Christ and having him. Like Moses in uh, Hebrews 11, he considered the treasures of Egypt as nothing because he saw the value and riches of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, the joy that is the greatest goal of ours is encouraging and nourishing our kids to be Disciplined by Christ to fall under his instruction and say that there's nothing worth, more worthy of my life than Christ himself. Here's what I want for you. Your kids to say one day, I've learned so much about Jesus 
from you, not just by the things you said, but by, by the way you treated me, mom and dad, the patience you showed me, the, the forgiveness you demonstrated for me, the tenderheartedness you had toward me, that you wept with me when I was weeping, that you rejoiced with me when I was rejoicing, that you showed me what grace means, and I've learned so much about Christ from you. Thank you for being my mom and my dad. Because here's what's going to happen. Point number three. The emancipation you foresee. You know what eman emancipation means? They're going to be set free, baby. And there's part of me that says, I can't wait to be empty nesters. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I can't wait to release you guys out into the world, but I'm sitting there going, but Lord, help the world if I do it right now. Amen? The, the Proverbs say that blessed is the, the, the man, the woman, the husband, the father, who has a quiver full of children. Your children are like arrows, and what does the, 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 the marksman do? Draws that arrow back and launches it into the world. What about children as you prepare them for the world? You're preparing your kids to enter a very interesting place. And you want them to first and foremost love God and love others. There's nothing important, more important for your kids than to love God and love others. Uh, John Trent, psychologist, said this. Our children begin the journey of life with high aspirations. Naive to the fact that they are walking into the gathering darkness of a fallen world, it's our calling and privilege to set before each of our children the light of the world, Jesus. The one who alone can save them, guide them, and keep them safe and warm both now and forever. And who modeled this? A woman by the name of Susanna Wesley. She was the wife of John Wesley. She bore 19 children. I think she's got some good parenting advice, don't you? Several of them, though, died as infants. But those who lived were more than a houseful. And despite the incredible demands put upon her as a mother, her goal every single week was to give each of her children an hour of just one-on-one -on -one relationship. Think about it. Daddy-daughter date day. Mommy, son, date day, where you spend an hour with each child and you invest in them. If they're in your home, that could be a goal for you. But if they're out of your home, here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. And this ties in with what Lori said. Spend an hour praying for your children that are no longer under your roof. And watch what God does. Pray for your child. And especially if your children are not living in a way that's honoring to the Lord. Here's what you need to trust. If God has put them on your heart, you need not think that they're on God's heart as well. Pray for them and then initiate time to connect with them. Just because they're not living the life you want them to live doesn't mean they're not deserving of relationship. Love them. Pray for them connect with them, continue to pour into their lives. Be the mom, the dad that maybe you were never while they were in your house, but there's no time like the present to do what's right. And trust God. To, perhaps you're, you're given an opportunity to model confession and repentance. Perhaps you need your adult child to, to see your brokenness. To come before them and say, I failed you. But one thing I'm understanding is that my failures are not fatal, and those failures are never beyond forgiveness. And you model this to your kids. Let them see the gospel working itself out in your own heart and life. And watch what God does. You are powerless to change their hearts and their lives, but you're always able to influence them through what God's doing in you and through you. Amen? It's not easy. Didn't promise you an easy message. I'm in the, I'm, I'm, I'm halftime right now with my kids. I got 14, 12, and 10. And my wife are continuing to learn what it means to be parents. Pray for us. We will pray for you. But thank God that any of our kids are more important to him than they could ever be to us.
but we have the gospel. And all I know is that with the gospel, there is hope. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the the truth that you have given to us as parents, as fathers, as mothers, as adults. Lord, it really does take a village. May we come together to encourage each other. May we come together to, to spur one another on when it comes to loving one another and especially our kids. Lord, we are praying for the Spirit to do work on all of their hearts, starting with ours, to bring about the, the beauty of the gospel. No matter what has happened, the, the gospel brings beauty from ashes, turns, turns uh, mourning into dancing. Lord, we're trusting you. As we are fully available for you to, to do in us and through us what you want, Lord, you put a special prize on the prize. Help us to have the marriages that reflect your heart. Help us to be parents that reflect your heart. And help our children be obedient because that reflects your heart. Lord, thanks for this morning. Thank you for loving us, for the riches we have in Christ, for which there's nothing in this world can compare to being loved by him. Thank you, and we pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you grace and peace forever and ever. Q&A next week. Submit your questions. Two weeks, we're going to talk about work. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out thechurchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.